Thank you so much, Lara, and I'd like to begin with thank yous as well. Um, thanks to Cotisol for having me here, and thanks to all of you for getting up on a Saturday morning and being here before the opening ceremony. I kind of thought that maybe 9 o'clock in the morning might be a little bit early, but thanks for being here. Um, Lara was just saying to me as she <coughs> left that what we were hoping to do was to allow um, about 10 minutes at the end for some questions. But seeing that we've started a little bit later, we might reduce that to about five. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to make a note of things as we're going through the presentation. Um, and I'll happily chat to anybody afterwards. In fact, I'd love to do that. Um, and with that, I'm going to go back a slide and begin at the beginning. And I know it's a little bit of a blurry one, but I wanted to put this up there at the beginning because when I saw this and I heard what the theme of the conference was this year, I thought, wow, I'd really like to be there. And I was excited for a number of reasons. First of all, um, by the topic, because I thought it puts teachers and classroom practice squarely in focus. And it really acknowledges that teachers are also creators of theory. Um, that there isn't this big divide between researchers and practitioners. That practitioners are theorists as well and creators of knowledge. And I think that that um, values the work that we do. Um, so for that reason, I was really thrilled. Um, the image that is conveyed here too by the road less traveled, and I have to just, as an aside, say that that really kind of, there's a little spark for me. Because you know where the road less traveled comes from? Anybody want to say for me? Robert Frost's poem? Yes, Robert Frost's poem, um, The Road Not Taken. And uh, Robert Frost has a real connection with Marlborough because he, was, uh, he helped with the founding of the college and he was a trustee. And when Walter Hendricks, just post Second World War, decided that he wanted to open a college, he went to Robert Frost and he said, hey, Bob, I want to start a college. I need your help. And Robert Frost apparently had been his mentor and a good friend. So when I saw that, I thought, well, that's an extra reason why it would be really nice to be there. Um, but also the notion, the metaphor of a road was one that really resonated with me. And that's what we're going to be. I'm using the metaphor of a road as the kind of theme for the presentation. Um, those of you who have been waiting here so patiently know that what the title is. It's developing a personal theory of teaching practice, the, ro the, the role of reflection in that. So what we're going to be doing in the next 30 odd minutes or whatever time we have left, basically this is my entire presentation on this slide. Um, there's the road. <laughs> We've got practice here. We've got personal theory up there. And along the way, we're going to engage in the process of reflection. And not just reflection, but um, what I'm going to be talking about is a form of critical reflection. Um, doing what Brookfield calls hunting assumptions and using four lenses to do that. So this, um, this image of a road um, and traveling along that road is what's going to be kind of guiding us. And I'll be coming back to this image kind of again and again. So with that, I'm going to invite you to go on a journey with me. Um, so let's begin with the bottom part of that image, our practice. And I'm going to whip through this one pretty quickly. When we talk about our practice, those of you have been to SIT and done the master's program there, and probably many others who've read David Hawkins's work, um, and our students at Marlborough would know this image, the triangle that we regard as the kind of heart of our practice, the I, the thou, and the it, set in a context. So when we're thinking about our practice, we think about I, the teacher, thou, the learner, with all that complexity and the culture and everything that that brings, and the it of the subject matter and everything that that brings. And all of that, there are interrelationships between those. Um, I've put down the references there. People often forget about Martin Buber, the German philosopher, because he was the first who really spoke about I and thou. 
And we tend to think of it as Hawkins with I, thou, and it. But ideas build on ideas. So we're beginning at the beginning of that road with our practice. But as we journey up towards a personal theory, as you know, if you're embarking on a journey, you've got to think about, well, where am I going? And is it worth going there? Why am I going there? So if we kind of thinking of our practice leading to a personal theory, what do we mean by a personal theory of teaching practice? Um, my current man of the moment is Brookfield. And I, I say that kind of jokingly, and I, but I mean it very seriously. Um, because the same as Earl Stevick was really influential in my thinking 20, 30 years ago, I think Brookfield is doing something similar for me now. He really, well, I'll be talking a lot about him. But he said, if you're thinking about a theory of practice or a rationale, well, I think you can read it here, a set of critically examined as core assumptions about why one does what one does in the way that one does it. So a theory of practice would answer the question, how do I teach and why do I teach like that? Um, and I think there are a number of reasons why it's pretty good to know that. So what might be, and this is where, at this stage, I'm going to kind of I didn't want to do it immediately. <laughs> I thought that I needed to fill in a bit of background and let you settle in and kind of get your morning head into gear before I did what I would normally do and say, let's do a little think, pair, and share activity here. Um, thinking about a personal theory of teaching practice, um, what, what might be some advantages to this? Why would it be useful to have that? And I'd like you to just take 30 seconds or so, think about that, and then maybe just, if you don't mind, chat to the person next to you or behind you and think, what are some of those advantages? If you can think of any. <laughs> I'm looking around the room, and it's obvious who were students of mine. <laughs> who uses the raised hand technique? Um, I didn't bring my tie bells, because that's my other little thing that I use if I want to get attention back here. Um, I'm sorry, I would have left you talking a little bit longer, but um, we're going to probably need to move on. So, as you were thinking about that and discussing it, um, did any of these ideas come up? The idea that if you can articulate why you do what you do and how you do it, you'd be better placed to communicate those ideas to colleagues. I mean, who's been in a position where you've wanted to do something but it hasn't been the kind of given practice in the institution. And you've had to either not do what you want to do, or you've had to really think about why you want to do that, and you've had to justify it. Um, when communicative language teaching came in, many institutions just said, there's too much noise. Can't do this. Um, and then you had to sort of think about, well, why are we doing it? Why are we having group work? Why are we having students talking? Um, and you could draw on second language acquisition theory for that. But if you thought it through, you could have a calm, reasoned set of reasons why you want to do what you do. And that, if you're ever in a position where you need to argue for something or request something, it really helps if you can put those reasons forward and not get all emotional about it and say, the English teachers just never get anything, you know, or we just don't have enough space, or... You just don't understand. Nobody can understand unless you can help them. Um, it really establishes credibility with your students. If your students know why you're asking them to do something, they'd be much more willing to do it. Um, were there, did anyone have anything that's not here? These are some of the ones that came out of Brookfield, but they were things that were, I'm sure, in all our heads as well. Nothing different. Anybody think it was not any use at all? Who would dare to say that? <laughs> Why did I even ask that? So, so having established that kind of the road we're going, that, that we're traveling on, is a worthwhile trip to take, um, we're back at the road again. So how are we going to arrive at that 
personal theory of teaching practice. How are we going to be able to articulate why we do what we do? Um, and the focus of what I'm going to continue with now is really the role of reflection, because I think that you can't get to that point without becoming a reflective <coughs> practitioner. But I'm going to take it maybe a step further than that too. So at this point, I've got another question for you. <coughs> we hear reflection, reflection, reflective practitioner, and it's really, you know, if, if you don't have somewhere in your program or somewhere in your jargon the fact that you're a reflective practitioner, you know, gosh, are you professional? It's, it's really a term that's been used a lot. Um, so if you don't mind doing what we did just now, and just take a second to think about it, and then just chat to, it doesn't have to be a pair, it can be a trio or a quad, what do you call a group of four quads? Well, you know what I mean, a quartet. Thanks, Jeff, yes. <laughs> um, so just have a quick chat about that too. What does reflection mean to you? It's kind of working. <laughs> now, if you were my students, what I'd be saying is, okay, guys, this is the deal. When I put my hand up and you see me, you do it as well and we all keep quiet. <laughs> so, this is a topic. Well, I, it's obvious why you, you're here, because reflection is something that resonates, I can hear, with you. Um, and I'm already hearing things, just the little comments that I could hear, that um, make me think, this is a good place to be, and a good thing to be talking about. So, reflection, I mean, if we think about, I'm not going to go into the theory of it, but if we think back right to John Dewey, um, what we might all agree is that reflection would be a meaning-making process that's systematic and rigorous, um, and that places value on personal and intellectual development, both of the self and the other. And as I said, that's taken it back to Dewey. And there have been so many people since then who have written about reflection. Um, and a lot of that writing, if we look at these images, does this conjure up something of what you were saying, that reflection is a way of looking at one's practice, kind of seeing into, and gets back to that system. At, so let's bring the next image in. The egg timer is meant to be the kind of timing, the, the trying to slow things down so that you can have a good look at it. Um, Janelle, do you mind if I quote you? She was just saying, you know, you can reflect on things, but if you don't document that reflection somehow, if you don't do something with it, it's kind of in the moment and it can be lost. And I was really pleased to hear that because I thought, yes, absolutely. So one of the ways in which both at SIT and um, currently at Marlborough we work with our students is using the experiential learning cycle, um, Kolb's cycle, um, where you look, you have a concrete experience and you spend time kind of slowing time down and looking at that experience in detail, thinking how you felt about it, what it reminded you of, um, a full rich description. And then you look at different interpretations of that. What could it mean? Um, and from that, you can say, well, what does this say to me? How can I generalize from this? This was one instance in my practice. But how, how does this affect the rest of my teaching? Is this going to be something that I'm going to take forward? And then you have um, your active experimentation, a decision to carry on and try things out. And so you sort of go around that cycle. Um, and that's part of reflection as well. I think using something like, and I know not everybody can fit in with or wants to use Kolb's experiential learning cycle. Some people are more visceral and need imagery and need to deal with images and emotion first. But I think it provides a really good um, a framework that is both rigorous and systematic that helps you work through it. Wow. I'm just realizing we need to watch time. So the final image here is the one that I'm going to, on when we looked at our road and I said we we're going to look at critical reflection and Brookfield's lenses because this is the element that I think in the work that I had done for many years um, 
working on a further diploma in education with South African teachers, working at SIT with master's candidates, and now at Marlborough. We, in many ways, took reflection for granted. We practiced it, we spoke about it. And I think that I've reached a point where I'm trying to be much more explicit about it and really unpacking it to know what does this mean? And Brookfield really did that for me. So in a way, I'm evolving, well, I hope we all keep evolving, um, but my own personal theory of practice is developing as I take on board a lot of what he's written about as well. And he reckons that if you not just reflect using something like the experiential learning cycle, but if you reflect on your practice using four lenses, the autobiographical lens, which is yourself, your, yourself as a learner and a teacher, all of your experiences, the things that sometimes people want to discount and say, what's that worth? Your experience and your learning is worth a lot. Then your students' eyes, how do you see how they're experiencing their learning and the opportunities that you're creating for that? So in other words, what you do. Um, your colleagues' experiences um, through maybe um, critical discussions, um, getting feedback from them, having, using them as critical friends, having them part as, of a conversation group. And then the theoretical literature. He doesn't discount that. Uh, it shouldn't be discounted. I'm drawing on it right now. I mean, I'm using the book field. So, so I'm taking from that field. And I, um, what I do need to say about him is that he's probably not well known in the field of English language teaching because he comes from the field of adult learning. And he's written a lot on adult learning theory, on critical reflection, and on teaching generally. Um, but we've been probably influenced quite a lot by his thinking on critical reflection. So, the way he says that you should go about using these lenses is to hunt down, maybe hunt is a bit aggressive, but to look for assumptions that undergird your teaching. What is it that we kind of take for granted? What is implicit in the way we do things? Um, Lara reminded me when we were chatting yesterday of a, a figure that I've often used in teaching teachers, and that is that if you think about the time that you spend in a teacher education course, an average course is about 130 hours. Um, if you're doing a TESOL certificate, that's usually what it is. If you're doing a three credit course, it's probably about 90 hours. If you're doing a whole master's program, well, there might be about 1,500 hours. But if you compare that to the amount of time that you spend as a learner, sitting as you are now, learning, listening, throughout your schooling, the power of that is so much, there's something like 13 to 14,000 hours. So whatever is done in a teacher education program has to be really powerful if you want to change any of that. Because we tend to teach the way we were taught. So what Brookfield is saying with critical reflection is, how do we uncover those assumptions that underlie our teaching? Um, so what I'm going to ask you right now, even though we are running out of time, but I think it's important, is to say, what do you hold to be true about teaching and learning English? What are some of the things that you, that would be like the water you swim in, like the air you breathe, that, that are implicit for you, that you don't even think about? But when you do think about it, you think, yes, of course. So, and think of a couple of those. What are those assumptions that guide you or beliefs? So again, they need a lot of exposure and a lot of practice, real practice. Absolutely, because to bring it from a thought up here into practice is another thing. So what, what would, if I could put the question back to you, what would be something that you believed that you would want to put into practice? or that you do put in practice. I really try to get them to talk about things that they that are about them, real things. 
it's not to repeat just sentences from the book, but always, always to transform it to be about them. It's given me a wonderful example because what I, what you're saying is that you believe that personal experience and something that um, matters internally to the student will actually support and help their learning. That's a really good assumption about teaching and learning. And these are the things that Brookfield reckons we need to uncover, not to invalidate them necessarily, but just to really examine them. To know, because what he maintains is that, so here we've got a much more complex diagram. And I'll just very briefly look at it. Because in at the heart of it, we've got four lenses the autobiography, your students, your colleagues, and the theory. In the middle, we have the assumptions that under, undergird our practice, these things that we believe in, that we do. And he said that actually there, there are three different kinds of assumptions. They're paradigmatic, which are the most buried, the ones that are most difficult to surface. Um, they're prescriptive ones and they're causal ones. Um, and just to give you an example of that, a paradigmatic assumption. Um, in South Africa, when we developed the further determinant of education for our teachers there, um, it was just post-apartheid. Um, it was 93-94. And my colleague and I were thinking about how we were going to structure this diploma that was trying to enable um, teachers of colour who had previously not, not had the advantaged education of white South Africans um, to enable them to get a fourth year so that they would be able to go into postgraduate work. Um, so it was it was kind of a bridging program, but it was also, for, well, this one was focused specifically on English language teaching. And anyway, being what we regard as progressive educators, I'm kind of smiling as you can see as I say that, we thought that we didn't want to do what Freire called banking education. This wasn't going to be knowledge transmission. This was going to be good democratic practice, where we had learner-centered teaching going on and where our students who were you know, teachers with a lot of experience were going to be self-directed. That was, for me, a paradigmatic assumption about the nature of adult learning. I believed that knowledge was socially constructed, that adults needed to be self-directed, and that there should be democratic processes in a classroom. And that really kind of was the impetus for the development. But I really needed to think about that because the teachers that we were working with um, had came in and they had very diff they were working from a very different paradigm in terms of adult learning and education and what they expected of lecturers at a university. And we had a bumpy ride. The first six months were not easy because they expected me to do what I'm doing now, to lecture. And I wasn't doing that. I was making them do activities and we were playing games. And I could see, especially a couple of the older men were thinking, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is not what is supposed to be happening. But I think fortunately we built up a pretty good relationship and I asked for feedback. And at first the feedback was quite hesitant and very polite, but as they got to know me and to trust me more, I got more honest feedback. <laughs> and a lot of it was, one. Of, I can never forget the one man said to me, Bev, you know you're very kind, but you've got to be a bit harder. Because um, a bit harder, you know, you've got to be tough, and you've got to lecture us, you've got to tell us more. And so, as I said, I kind of learned what it means to operate out of a paradigmatic assumption about the nature of learning. Um, the next round that I did with the next group of FDEs, I began the course by saying, what are your expectations of me, of the program, of yourself, and of each other? And can I engage in that same activity and tell you what my expectations are? And it was interesting because, of course, there were huge differences. But by putting it out and exploring it up front did help. 
And I have to say that by the end, it was a part-time course, and by the end of the two years, the first group that I'd had my big kind of bump with um, really acknowledged the value of group work and themselves, that they, they really did see that they were repositories of knowledge and that their experience was worthwhile. But I also had to make some compromises along the way, thinking that I couldn't expect them to move into a way of being that wasn't necessarily comfortable or one that they didn't um, subscribe to initially. So does that kind of make sense about the paradigmatic assumption? So they, they also the notion of power and hegemony there, and I'm not going to go into that but because I can't do justice to it. But classrooms are contested spaces, um, and there are always power dynamics going along that are going on there. And in terms of hegemony, these are things that we subscribe to because we think they might be good for us, but actually they mightn't be. Something along the lines of um, student evaluations and expecting to get the perfect 10. We all want to get good evaluations, don't we? Um, and it's great when you do, and when you don't. I'll never forget one of my, um, one of my students at Marlborough um, is Russian, and she's teaching in Saudi Arabia at the moment. And she told me that she got feedback from one of her students, just one of her students, that was really quite negative. She forgot about all the rest, or, you know, all the 20 odd that were positive. And that one negative one really rankled. It was very, very hard. And I think that if we subscribe to the notion that we need to get, you know, these fantastic evaluations all the time, and that we can be all things to all people, we're not doing ourselves justice because we actually can't. And if we subscribe to that, we will allow something to persist. And that's why what we mean by the notion of hegemony, allowing something to continue that isn't necessary in our best interests. And that is determined by kind of outside influences. So I recommend you read Brookfield's Becoming um, a Critically Reflective Teacher. Um, and I'm just going to look at a couple of lenses. I think we've run out of time, just about. Um, an autobiographical lens. As I said, value your own learning and put yourself into the position of being a learner as often as possible. Um, this was for a, a TESOL certificate student who said that learning, being a learner in an Afrikaans session really made him see what it's like to learn a language and how he, the issues he might have to face teaching his language. Um, that was another example of your own learning experience. And this is the one little bit that I thought you might want to take out of here. I've, I've got a couple of handouts with it on, but I know this is all going to be available digitally. But you might want to have a quick look at this because Brookfield says one of the other things you can do yourself to engage in critical reflection is well, we at a conference, this is something I should maybe put up there because he says, look at something, here, briefly describe it, the when, where, what, and who. Make a note about what it was that was positive and what you can do in your teaching that you saw in that presentation. What was there that was negative that you reacted to and what will you want to avoid in your teaching as a result of that? And then thoughts about what the person could have done differently that would have made you either be more positive or more, but you don't want to be more negative, but would have avoided that reaction. And then based on what you've done, the notes you've made, what lessons can you take back for your teaching practice? So I thought just sort of on practical ends, I would put that there. The next question was your students, the students' eyes. What do you do to get feedback from your students? Um, there's a critical incident report. Again, this will be available, so we can't go through it. Um, and using your colleagues, um, helping you, asking your colleagues to help you think through things. Um, we use the ORID framework for this. Objective questions, reflective questions, interpretive questions, and decisional questions. It basically 
follows the experiential learning cycle. But it's a question format that you can ask a friend or colleague to work with you and engage in. That was going to be for another story or question to you. So this brings us back to the path, that we, the, the road that we were travelling of, looking at our practice, being able to articulate why we do what we do, and using critical reflection to help us uncover those assumptions that undergird our teaching, and that will help us develop a theory of practice. And I'm sorry that we, can't, we started late, so we've kind of lost 10 minutes here. Um, but I wanted to end on time. And anyone who has questions, I'm going to be around the next couple of days. Well, today and tomorrow, anyway. So thank you for being patient and for engaging when you did. Thank you.